I am on fire and so are you. That is an activating element to the universe. And we say welcome, welcome to everyone who is here. Some of us do not tune in to the news and some of us get inundated with the news. This morning, as an emissary for peace, I want to bring you a prayer that's been modified from Ernest Holmes. Let me start with 1 Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to those you were called that you are already a blessing. It is a universal law of attraction, not something that unity made up. It's not just earnest homes or new thought. But what you put out into the universe, your thoughts and your words attract likeness. So if you are not where you want to be along your life path, you have the power to change through your words and your thoughts. So my question might be, what are you attracting to you? Martin Luther King Jr. said this, hate begets hate. Violence begets violence. Toughness begets a greater toughness. He also said we must meet the forces of hate with the power of love. King believed that violence is a cycle that multiplies evil instead of diminishing it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. Likewise, love attracts love. Patience attracts more patience. Generosity attracts more generosity, for we do not live in lack consciousness. There is more than enough. There's more than enough resources. There's more than enough ideas. There's more than enough love. And there is more than enough you. Love always wins. So from Dr. Ernest Holmes, trusting in the divine destiny of these United States and in the preservation of liberty, security, and self-expression, I offer this prayer. Take a breath. I know and affirm that divine intelligence governs the destiny of these United States, directing the thought and the activity of all who guide our affairs. I know and affirm that success, prosperity, and happiness are inherent gifts of freedom, and rightfully so, the divine inheritance of all of us. I know and affirm that success, prosperity, and happiness are now operating in the affairs of every individual in this country. If you do not believe this to be so, hold this as an affirmation to the universe so that what we are thinking about, where our thoughts go, the likeness is attracted and will create it to be so. I know and affirm that divine guidance is at hand and enlightens the collective mind of all in this country, divine guidance ensures economic security to all without the loss of personal freedom or individual self-expression. I know and affirm that the all-knowing mind of God's spirit holds a solution to every challenge facing our country today. And since we do not believe that we are separate from that God's spirit mind, we have within ourselves to be true that we have the solutions for every upset in our country today. May we, along with our leaders, open our hearts and our minds to this divine wisdom, availing ourselves of its guidance to foster peace and prosperity for all. I know and affirm that our spiritual democracy will not only endure, but will also ensure personal liberty, well-being, and the right to self-expression for each one of us. This is the peace 
that surpasses all understanding, embracing through the millennials to come our divine birthright of abundance, security, and love. May we walk in the light of our highest selves, guided by wisdom and compassion, as we lift up and empower every person on this planet. And so it is. Amen. So if you haven't watched what's been going on, we're always filled with changes. And how interesting that today the topic is the power of discomfort. Oh, hello, universe. We are all flowing in the same alignment. <laughs> I just talked about the beautiful prayer from St. Francis. About 15 years ago, my daughter came to me from college and she said, you know, I couldn't get the class I signed up for, so I'm taking Italian instead. And I said, oh, I think that's wonderful. She has a real affinity towards the different languages. And then she said to me, well, you know, the really cool part about this is they have a Maymester, and the Maymester is in Italy. And I looked at her and I said, oh, that is fabulous. And I said, do you know how long I've wanted to go to Italy? And my daughter's like, what? I said, about 35 years. And my daughter goes, well, you can come see me at the end of the trip. So I did. I did. And she was so good, that whole May Mester. She had this little budget, and every day they had their gelato, and they did their little classes, and I show up and blow all that out of the water. But we had one specific little tiny trip that a lot of people don't do in Italy, and it was in the town of Assisi. Now, if you've never been there, it is a tiny little town way on top of a hill above the lemon groves, and it's tiny. It's tiny. And so we get in there, and these little nuns are about yay big. About yay big. And honey, they can climb that hill. They can climb that hill. And I'm over there going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm so American. Oh, my God. <laughs> but it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. So when you sing that song, and I listened to it before I prepared this message, that hill that we climb. It's not even so much about that destination as the journey for us to get there. And how do we act and react and who do we bring in our inner circle and who do we set outside maybe with healthy boundaries? Because who wants to be in the place of discomfort? Many of us try to avoid it to the very best of our ability. Some of our personalities, we just shut down. Like, you coming at me, I'm just not going to respond. And some of us like to, like, out the door, see ya. And never coming back in to finish the discussion. And then some of us, like <clears throat> I've been accused of, are not conflict adverse. <laughs> so spill it and get it out there and let's get it on the table and let's just muddle and mold in it until we can just get rid of it. And so that brought me to a fairy tale that I bet many of you know called The Princess and the Pea. <laughs> I remember as a little girl my little part in that, that show. But this one, I had to go and look it back up. So it's about 1835 that this wisdom came through this writer's fingers. And if you don't remember this story, the handsome prince travels throughout the land to find his bride. But he does not find her. He is defeated, deflated. And he comes back to that grand castle, and there's this huge storm, lightning and rain, and a little tap, tap, tap on the castle door. And of course, who is it? The princess. The princess. But Mama doesn't really believe she's a princess. So Mama Queen decides, why is it always the women that are the bad ones in the stories? You know, I don't know what that is about. Maybe it's kind of like the discernment piece. we got to make sure you're real. So anyways, the little princess is just bedraggled, and they get her all cleaned up and fluffed up, and they put her in the bed. And if you remember the story, they put a hard, uncooked pea on the very bottom, and they layer it with 20 mattresses and then 20 bed feather cloths. So this little, tiny, fluffy, delicate thing gets in there, 
and the night passes, and they have breakfast together. And at breakfast, do you remember the story? She's so bruised and battered, she doesn't know what was going on in that bed all night. And the mother goes, oh, I think she really is a princess. So, of course, in fairy tale land, and I know this will be true for Robert, but in fairy tale land, you get married and live happily ever after. So when I look at this story and I think, wow, what is my hard, uncooked pea? <laughs> what is that little thing that just irks a snot out of me? Because we all have it. Some of us have done tremendous amounts of work, self-reflection, workshops, Bible training, no Bible training, and we've come to this place after 30, 40, 50 years that we kind of got it. We've been working on it. And then something happens. That onion peels back one more layer, and you got to do it again. That is our discomfort. That is our discomfort. There's a beautiful teacher in the Ernest Holmes ways that came to me through a magazine. Thank you, Judith. And as I read what he had to say, I thought, you know, to be uncomfortable, when we want to get back to comfortable, we get a gift to examine what is making us so uncomfortable. What is it that we've either put underneath 20 feather mattresses, <laughs> the carpet, the family drama, whatever it is we haven't faced, what is it that we might look at? So this beautiful man, Eugene Holden, says this. As good as life is, we can sometimes experience uncomfortable situations. Some of these experiences can be blessings in disguise, guiding us to choose something greater. You know, if you're just happy-go-lucky and the world's working for you, we don't tend to stretch. Nothing is out of sync. Matter of fact, we're in sync. So when something disrupts that flow, when something makes us a little uncomfortable, I see it as an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to expand where we already are. He says, learning to be comfortable with the uncomfortable allows us to see where the blessings are. Learning to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. So when we're uncomfortable, we try to do whatever our techniques are that bring us back to center, unless it's avoidance. Being uncomfortable for us can be a call to transformation. And what is the definition of transformation? We're going from one way of being to another way of being. We are transforming our ideals, our beliefs, our patterns. We are opening ourselves, I will say, to a new awakening. We have the opportunity when things are uncomfortable for a new awakening. Eugene Holden says this, I trust in the power of my word and the law that acts upon it. I am guided to experience only the highest and best always and in all ways. So when your world isn't working, when you have this opportunity, this gift for transformation, we talk often in the new thought patterns of using words and affirmations, positive statements of truth, because if we're not there, then we're unveiling to become. We don't have to punish ourselves and say, you should already be there. You should, should, what does should do? When you're shouldn't on yourselves, we're going to release that. So instead we look at, so if I'm not exactly where I want to be today, what is it I might yearn to be? For that is already within you. Like we were talking yesterday, and I have to give a little kudos. We had 13 magnificent goddesses in here yesterday. We did. And part of our work was looking at what is already within us, like that little walnut to the tree, the potentiality of expanding life is within each one of us. 
and how we want to show up, how we want to demonstrate who we are already as blessings. So he's using an affirmation that if you're not quite there or you're a little out of sync or life feels to be a little uncomfortable, he's using words to create that pattern, that comfort level. I am guided to experience only the highest and best, always and in all ways. As we surrender to the divine being within us, as us, we start to experience ways where it seems there was no way before. Have you done that? Have you ever set an intention and you're like, I got this one. And there's some little something static in the way. And now you look at somebody you care about and go, I ain't got this. I don't even know how to get from here to here. And I think that's on purpose. I think that's intentional for us. For when we don't know, what does that open up? Curiosity. Opportunities. Channels to learn. When we know everything, because some of us know everything, <laughs> we don't have any opportunities to learn. When we say, I don't know. I'm ready for the next. I'm open to receive guidance. I'm here for that divine wisdom. And how does wisdom come? Experience. Sometimes you fall down to learn how to stand up. And it's okay. It's okay. We don't have to be perfect all the time. So I love, and not usually at the moment that it happens, when I get these beautiful gifts and opportunities, and I'm like, I don't have a clue. Because I'm not supposed to. That is the learning. That is the gift. That's when you attract in what you're putting out there. That is the gift to the people who come in your life, whether it's a hard time or a good time, the ideas that come in your life, because now you don't know. You don't know. You're open to receive. It's a vulnerability that is surrounded in a truth that surpasses all understanding. When we talk about the mystery of God, the mystery of what is it we cannot see, that spirit-filled world, can you listen for the message? Can you be open to receive what you cannot see? And if that sounds like a far-out concept, how about something really easy like love? Can you be open to receive love? My buddy, Edwin Gaines, one of my favorite ministers, she said, what I know with clarity and certainty is that when you make a 100% commitment to do or be something and you take every step with integrity, the universe will open up a way where before there was no way. The universe will rush in to support you. It cannot be a vague, hazy, wishy-washy statement. You have to be passionate. When we talk about prayers, when you sit on the couch and you do your kumbaya and you're being so good with your little candle, but there's no feeling behind it, the universe says, all right, tell me what you want. I'm right here. I'm ready. But you got to feel into it. Bring the passion. Have the courage to bring the passion. Eugene Holden says this, as we surrender to the divine being within us as us, we start to experience ways being made out of seeming no way. In fact, the way is made easy. Our job is to know and trust the affirmation, I am, I am the life of God. All that God makes through me is done with ease and grace. I release the discomfort of fear, doubt, and worry, for I trust in the divine within me as me. It's our opportunity to see and know that God is within 
each one of us. We just simply release, simply, the fear, the worry, and the doubt. Now, I've done this little exercise once before, but I want to bring you something really, I thought, speaks very much to those of us who know we know, and we know how to control, and we know how to prepare, and then sometimes life throws something our way that really throws us out there in that level of discomfort, and here we go. This is a poem by John Rodell. Hello, God. Hello. I'm falling apart. Can you put me back together? God, I'd rather not. Why? Because you aren't a puzzle. What about all the pieces of my life that are falling down onto the ground? And God says, let them stay there a while. They fell off for a reason. Take some time and decide if you need any of those pieces back. You don't understand. I'm breaking down. No, you don't understand. You are breaking through. What you are feeling are just growing pains. You are shedding the things and the people in your life that have been holding you back. You aren't falling apart. You are falling into place. Relax. Take some deep breaths. Allow those things that you don't need anymore to fall off of you. Quit holding onto those pieces that don't fit you anymore. Let them fall off. Once I start, what will be left of me? Only the very best of you. <gasps> I'm scared of changing. I keep telling you, you are not changing. You are becoming. Becoming who? Becoming who I created you to be. A person of light and love and clarity and hope and courage and joy and mercy and grace and compassion. I made you more than the shallow pieces you have adorned yourself with through the years that you've clinged to with greed and fear. Let that fall away from you. I love you. Don't change. Become. Become. Become who I made you to be. I'm going to keep telling you this, some of us hard-headed ones, until you get it. There goes another piece, I said. Yep, God said. Let it be. So I'm not broken? Of course not, God said. But you are breaking like the dawn. It's a new day. Become. And so it is. Amen.